Good morning. If you would like to turn in your scriptures to 2 Kings chapter 2, which will be our focus today, where we will come to the end of Elijah's ministry and we will see Elisha's ministry begin. We have titled this lesson, Lord, Make Me an Elisha. We will learn important truths from Elijah's final act and from Elisha's big ask that we can apply to our own walk of faith with the Lord. So if you will join me in prayer. Lord God, apart from you, we can do nothing. And apart from your Holy Spirit, we have no understanding of your word. So I pray, Father God, that you would send forth your Holy Spirit to attend your word, to open our hearts to understand, to move our spirits and wills to obey. Lord, we want you to change us today through this story of Elijah and Elisha. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to begin by reading the first eight verses of chapter 2. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at the distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. So in the first verse, we, the readers, are made aware that Elijah's ministry days are numbered. His ministry has been fulfilled now that he has cleansed the apostasy of the rule and reign of Ahab and the idolatrous kings. And we see that the younger prophets in each of the cities had a knowing, too, that Elijah was going to be taken from them. And these different schools of prophets were like branch campuses of um, prophecy schools that ministered under Elijah. They were kind of like seminary students, and they knew it as well. So at both Bethel and Jericho, they came out and Eli asked Elisha, do you not know that your master is going to be taken from you today? And of course, Elisha knew it, but he didn't want to speak about it. He said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Even Elijah knew it, for he was paying his final visits to these three schools of prophets, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho, each which represented historic moments in Israel's history. And each stop, Elijah urges Elisha to stay behind. And with each stop, the suspense builds, even though we know the outcome. He did everything he could to shake Elisha off from him, and, but Elisha clung to him with dogged determination. Elisha was going to stay with him until the very end. You see, Elisha had been following Elijah ever since he was first called to ministry in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you remember, that's when Elijah was told by God that he still had work to be done, and he was to go and anoint Elisha. And he went and found him and threw his cloak upon him, which symbolized the call of God on Elisha's life to be a prophet. 
At the end of 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 21, it says that Elisha arose and went after Elisha and assisted him. You see, they were always together. And at this time in 2 Kings chapter 2, seven years had passed from when that cloak was placed upon him. They were always together. And perhaps most significantly, Elisha and Elijah were together to witness God's miraculous power. Not only on Mount Carmel, but immediately there at the River Jordan when Elijah struck it with his cloak and the water parted. Elisha took such good care of Elijah over these years that eventually he became known as, quote, the prophet who poured water on the hands of Elijah, which is in chapter 3. As he spent time with Elijah, we can be certain that he undoubtedly learned many lessons in ministry and truths about God and truths about faith in his own walk um, of faith with the Lord. The mentoring relationship between Elijah and Elisha is one of the clearest examples of scripture of God's master plan for building his church. The final command of the Lord Jesus Christ before he ascended into heaven with the Father, after the resurrection but before his ascension, was to his disciples in Matthew 28, to go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples of all people, teaching them everything I commanded them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is our call. All authority has been given to Jesus, and he gives it to us to go and make disciples. That is our call from the Lord, to be a disciple and to make disciples. Point number one, I am called to be a disciple and to disciple others. I am called to be a disciple and to disciple others. It's been God's plan from the beginning. Moses discipled Joshua and Joshua carried on. Elijah with Elisha, Paul with Timothy. Today the work continues. It's how the next generation learns about God and learns how to move into areas of ministry and grow in their own individual faith. It is important that we heed the call of the Lord to be a disciple and then to make disciples of others. And we can begin with our own family around the dinner table. It's as easy as that. So why was Elijah telling Elisha to stay behind at each city? It seems kind of strange, doesn't it? But most likely, he who had been with him for seven years was putting Elisha to the test to prove that he was ready to receive God's anointing. And Elisha did prove it through his humility in caring and serving Elijah over seven years and also through his loyalty and his commitment to him. God looks for people who are committed, who are loyal, who are humble in service. And Elisha did prove it. For when they crossed the Jordan, Elijah asked Elisha to make a bold request. So let's pick up in verse 9 and 10. When they had crossed the Jordan, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken from you. And Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. So at first glance, Elisha's request <laughs> seems kind of greedy. Like, I want a double portion of your spirit. And how, how is Elijah going to give double of what he has? I mean, if you have $100 in your pocket, you can't give double to somebody who is asking. But, you know, who did Elisha think he was? But he wasn't asking what we were thinking. I mean, he hadn't even performed any miracles yet. And here he is asking Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. What Elisha was asking for is he was asking to be treated as if he was the firstborn son of Elijah. According to Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, God had told the Israelites that the oldest son had a right to a double portion of his father's estate. When a man died, you see his legacy was divided into equal shares, one share for each heir. 
but two shares always went to the firstborn son. Now, obviously, the oldest son could not inherit twice as much as the father owned, but he did receive a double portion of the inheritance of his father. This is what Elisha is asking for. He wanted to be treated as Elijah's firstborn son, spiritually speaking. Perhaps that's why later on in the chapter he calls his mentor, my father, my father. Elijah, Elisha, I get it mixed up. Elisha wanted Elijah's spirit. And by spirit, he didn't mean his disposition or his temperament, but he meant the Holy Spirit that was in and upon Elijah as he ministered in God's power. What empowered Elijah to accomplish his ministry was the supernatural presence, power, and gifting of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Elisha craved. Elisha desired and chose a spiritual inheritance. His deepest desire to was have the living power of the Holy Spirit in his life and in his ministry. Remember, he had already been designated by God chapters earlier to be Elijah's successor, but he recognized that he would never even become half the prophet that Elijah had been without a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Point number two, the primary qualification for effective ministry is the living presence of the Holy Spirit. The primary qualification for effective ministry is the living presence of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the great lessons of the early church that is shown from the book of Acts. If you remember, Jesus had told his disciples before he ascended to go into Jerusalem and wait until they were clothed from on high. And then in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they would receive power to go forth and be his witnesses. The church would not have been birthed without the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And I want you to understand, these disciples already believed in Jesus. They already had received the Holy Spirit that Jesus breathed into him in John 21 when he came through the door and said, peace I bring to you, peace, and he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So what is this second thing? This second thing in Acts chapter 1 is they needed the Holy Spirit to fall down upon them to empower them to be effective witnesses to build the church. And so it was when they chose leaders and deacons in Acts chapter 6, they chose men who were full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. When they chose Barnabas, they chose a man full of the Holy Spirit. That is the way they ministered and the church was birthed and it continues on to this day. And that is what Elisha craved. He knew that he had to have the living power of the Holy Spirit, the double portion come upon it upon him. You see, followers of Jesus Christ, you and me who want to be effective in acts of mercy or in your prayer life or in teaching or in evangelism or in healing or in prophecy or any of the spiritual gifts that are listed in the scripture must have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them to be effective for the church to go out and God to get the glory. Elisha teaches you and me and every believer that we are to ask God for a double portion of the Holy Spirit that we see at work in other believers that we desire in our own life. Point number three, ask God. I am to ask God for a double portion of his spirit to empower my gifts to glorify God. Ask God for a double portion of his spirit to empower your gifts to glorify God. What you do is you look around the church or in ministries you're involved in, you take notice of men and women whose lives bear the unmistakable stamp of the Holy Spirit. You listen to those who are fervent in prayer and notice those who are bold in evangelism and watch those who are merciful in their deeds. Hear those that are powerful in teaching and then ask 
God for a double portion of the gift that you are desiring or the gift that's already within you. Hear those that are doing it. Ask him for that gift. Ask him for a double portion of the gift to witness. Ask him for a double portion of the gift of mercy or prayer or healing or teaching. That's what Elijah asked. And James says, we have not because we ask not. Jesus says in Matthew, Luke, Luke 11, that how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We just simply don't ask. We are to learn from Elijah to ask the Lord for the double portion of the gifts that he has already, each one of us has at least has one spiritual gift. We may have more, but we need to ask for that double anointing. Ask God for the double portion of his spirit to empower your gifts to glorify God. So that's what Elijah asks. And Elijah says it's a hard thing. Let's continue in verse 10 through 12. Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And they still went on and talked. And behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And then he saw him no more. So it begins with Elijah saying that Elisha has asked a hard thing, meaning that Elijah knew it was not his to give. Therefore, it was a hard thing for him to be able to grant. But obviously the Lord had spoken to Elijah because he said in order for Elisha to get the double portion of the Holy Spirit, he had to witness Elisha's ascension up into heaven. And he does. He has been given the spiritual sight to see Elijah taken up in the whirlwind. Notice that none of the student prophets that were all there, none of them saw it. Only Elisha had the spiritual eyes to see. And when Elisha saw Elijah taken up to heaven, he was given a glimpse of the glorious ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Elijah's departure was a picture of the Lord's ascension into heaven. You see, Elijah was taken up when he was still in his physical body, living. He was living and breathing. And so his ascension up in the whirlwind is known as a type or a spiritual pattern um, of the Old Testament. You see, a type or a pattern in the Old Testament is an event or something that symbolizes an aspect of the ministry of Jesus Christ. In this case, Elijah's ascension being taken up in the whirlwind is a symbol, a type of Jesus' ascension. For you see, Jesus, the disciples of Jesus saw pretty much the same thing when they were on that mountain and Jesus raised his hands in blessing and told him to go, therefore, to make disciples of all nations. They witnessed him being lifted up in a cloud before their eyes up into heaven. So Elisha saw it, meaning that the request was going to be granted. So let's pick up at the 12B and following. Then Elisha took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. In an act of grief, Elisha tears his clothes, which was a symbol of mourning in the Old Testament, for Elijah, his beloved mentor, was gone. He knew he could cope well enough without Elijah. But what he knew is he could not live without Elijah's God. He could not live with the God of providence who fed Elijah by the brook with the ravens. He could not live without the God of the resurrection who raised the widow's son. He could not live without the God of power who put Baal to shame on Mount Carmel and sent the rain on the land. He knew he could not live without the God of compassion who had spoken to Elijah in the still small voice in the depths of his depression. And he could not live without the God of justice who had punished Ahab and Jezebel for their greed. 
Elisha knew he simply could not live or minister without the spirit of God who had been at work in Elijah. So he cries out, my father, my father, in deep grief. And then he takes the cloak. Notice Elijah ascended, but the cloak was left behind. He could have walked off. But an act of faith and receiving the calling that God had placed on his life, he leans down and picks up the cloak. And he says, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? I think at that moment, his deepest need is he needed God to show up. He needed to know that God was present and that God was still with him. And he took it and he struck, used that cloak and he struck the Jordan and the water parted. You see, the miracle of the water parting affirmed that the mantle had fallen from Elisha, Elijah onto Elisha and he had received the double portion of Elijah's spirit. But it did more than that. It accredited God. It proved that the God of Elijah was still at work. That the God of Elijah is a living God. So where is the God of Elijah? He is right here among us today. Still living, still working, still blessing, still moving. He is the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Point number four, the God of Elijah is still at work among us today. The God of Elijah is still at work among us today. You see, Elijah's God is the God we need at this and every moment of our life. Whatever the need is, God is God. Do we need a God to give us our daily bread? This is the God of Elijah and Elisha. Do we need a God who comforts? God will comfort us in the way he comforted Elijah and Elisha. Do we need a God who provides strength for ministry? God is the God who provides the strength for the ministry. We never must forget that Elijah was a man just like us. Where now is the God of Elijah? He is right here. And his spirit is still at work in and through the Elishas of the church today. When the famous evangelist and radio preacher Donald Gray Barnhouse died after 33 years of ministry, the loss was deeply felt throughout the evangelical church. And not long afterwards, Eternity Magazine published an entire memorial issue honoring Dr. Barnhouse. And readers saw immediately when they opened the issue in big, bold words, Lord, make me and Elisha. The magazine's rousing, battling cry was followed by these words, quote, the Lord's warrior has departed and his mantle has been dropped at our feet. We who sat at the feet of Donald Gray Barnhouse and met Christ with every word he spoke, owe oh, a debt of love, a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. His courage to speak the truth, his passion for reconciling Christ's people to each other, his flaming heart consumed in service. These compel us to take up the mantle and say, Lord, make me an Elisha. Make me strong and faithful. Continue in me the work in which you have begun in this thy servant. This should be every Christian's prayer. Point number five. Lord, make me an Elisha. Continue the good work which is begun in me. Lord, make me an Elisha. Continue the good work which is begun in me. So the mantle has fallen, the anointing has come, he's parted the water, he comes back, and he is greeted by the prophets who did not see Elisha taken up in the whirlwind. So let's pick up in chapter, I mean in verse 15. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, 
the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They recognized that he had received the mantle. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold, now there are with your servant fifty strong men. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Okay, send, go. Therefore, they sent 50 men, and for three days they sought and did not find him. And when they came back to him, he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? It's kind of a funny story. I mean, the 50 prophets are you know, begging Elijah to go look for Elijah. And Elisha's already seen him taken up to heaven, and they want to form this search and rescue team, looking in the mountains and everywhere for him. And finally, he's just tired of them badgering him, so he tells them to go. And then after three days, they come back. Obviously, they didn't find him. He said, did I tell you not to go? But he receives the mantle, and now he is moving out and beginning his ministry. So we're going to see two more miracles in this chapter, which continue to affirm that he is the successor to Elijah and being God's prophet in the land. In verse 19 through 21, now the men of the city said to Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as the Lord, my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. An interesting aside, there is a fountain of Elisha in Jericho today, which still is producing fresh living water. The leaders of Jericho come out to meet Elisha and they recognize that he has the anointing of the prophet. So they approach him and they inform him of their bad water, that it's contaminated and it's made their land unfruitful, making their land barren. They can't grow anything if they have bad water. The water was deadly because the city was under a curse. Remember Dina's teaching several weeks ago that she had informed us that Jericho, first of all, Jericho was the first Canaanite city that Joshua and the Israelites conquered when they entered the promised land. And at that time, Joshua laid a curse on that city when the walls came tumbling down, stating, quote, curse before the Lord, any man who rebuilds this city, Jericho. And then we saw way back when Dina taught it in 1 Kings 16, during Ahab's reign, Hael of Bethel rebuilt Jericho at the expense of his own sons. You see, the city of Jericho, because it was caught up in idolatrous worship, was still under the curse of God. And this dry city needed what Elisha could provide, living water. So Elisha tells him to bring them a new bowl and to put salt in it. Well, when you read the scripture, you think, well, why a new bowl? Wouldn't an old bowl work just as well? Why is he saying a new bowl? Well, the answer is that God was about to do something new and different. Remember we said weeks ago, never put God in a box. He's always up to doing things new and different. And then Elisha throws salt in the bowl. Why salt? Well, salt is one of the signs of the covenant of, between God and his people. In Numbers 18, God had told the priests and the Levites, quote, all the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give to you and to your sons and daughters with you as perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord. So you see, salt was a sign of a covenant. And by Elisha throwing the salt into the new bowl, he was using it as a representation to renew the covenant between God and the city of Jericho. So he throws the salt into the bowl and says, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water and cleansed this um, From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. You see, God healed 
and cleanse this city, restoring its material and spiritual vitality, making them back and restoring them back into covenant with himself. God was truly doing something new here in Jericho, giving Jericho a new beginning by providing living water. But you see, the story is really about what God did. God healed the water. And if God can heal the water, he can heal you. Elisha was just the instrument doing what God had told him to do. For you see, when Elisha did God's work in God's way, God's blessing flowed. He was able to provide the living water. Because he based and staked his life on the word of God. And he obeyed the word of God and he spoke the word of God. Point number six. When I do God's work in God's way, God's blessing flows. When I do God's work, God's way, God's blessing flows. Elisha was one who did God's work in God's way. He answered the call of God, doing the ministry that God had chosen for him to do. He prayed and asked for the blessing of God's spirit, and he took his stand on the word of God that Elijah had spoken to him. He acted on faith in God's word by taking up the cloak of Elijah and striking the water. In doing this, he was staking his entire ministry on the validity and truth of God's word. For he was convinced that the same God who had parted the sea for Moses, the same God who had parted the sea for Joshua, and the same God who parted the sea for Elijah would also part it for him. In every instance, Elisha did God's work in God's way, and the blessing of God followed. Sadly, many believers in the church today do God's work in their own way and in their own strength. They choose their own ministry in the church without seeking God or asking God or receiving a call from God or seeking him in prayer. They step out in ministry without praying for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But when God's work is done in God's way, he receives, she receives God's blessing. Now, the chapter ends with one of the most bizarre <laughs> stories I could have left it out. Um, of the Old Testament, if you want to pick up in verse 23. So after he heals the water, Elijah goes up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him saying, Go up, you bald head. <laughs> Go up, you bald head. And he turned around and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. And from there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from then he returned to Samaria. <laughs> well, first of all, it's interesting that very rarely does God give physical descriptions of people. He's always, you know, God is a God who looks at the heart, not an outward appearance. So I guess Elijah was bald. I don't know. They call him <laughs> old baldy. But when I say small boys, it was really like teenagers. It was a rogue group of teenagers in Bethel where King Jeroboam had set up idol worship. And so you see this whole community had set up themselves against the living God and they despised anything spiritual. Thus, they sought to attack God's prophet, Elisha, as he passed by. Go up, go up, meaning get out of here. Go up like Elisha you did. Be gone. Shoo. They shout. They shout names, mocking him, showing utter disrespect for God's servant. You see, God will not be mocked, and God desires his servants to be treated with the utmost respect. For whenever they are attacked, God takes it personally. Elisha, notice, did not defend himself, did not fight back, did not scold. Rather, he calls down a curse in God's name for God's glory. God didn't have to respond, but he did. And what I found interesting was, in researching this, was um, God sent out the bears for God to curse God's prophet was to curse God. And to curse God was to die at the hand of his judgment. I'm sure a book that you visit often is Leviticus. <laughs> In Leviticus chapter 24, verse 15, 
God says, speak to the people of Israel and say, whoever curses his God shall surely be put to death. And then in Leviticus 26, he continues saying, I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock and make you few in number so that your roads will be desert, deserted. You see, God would not be mocked. He would not allow the cursing against his servant, Elisha. And it's the same today. None of us should ever say a word about the leaders in our church or the ministers who have the call of God. They're men and women just like us, with strengths and weaknesses just like us. But they have the anointing of God upon them. And when you curse or say something against a leader in the church, it is if you are cursing and mocking God. Even David recognized it when Saul, the crazy king, was trying to kill David. And then David later had an opportunity to kill Saul and his men were urging him to. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, he says, God forbid that I lay a hand on God's anointed. He allowed God to avenge whatever Saul had done in his way and in his time. And so that is what the story of the she bears, the covenant bears that God sends out to defend his name and his prophet, Elijah. Point number seven, God's work done in God's way has God's protection. God's work done in God's way has God's protection. You see, God's word always comes true. Back at Jericho, the word of God, spoken through Elisha, brought blessing, brought living water to Jericho and to their land. Now at Bethel, God's word came true again, but this time it was spoken in judgment against the teen delinquent teenagers. God's work done in God's way has God's protection. As a true prophet of God, Elisha, was protected by the mighty power of God. And if God's work has God's protection, it is not to be mocked. So in this chapter, just in summary, we learn from Elisha that you and I too need the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us to move out in the spiritual gifts that God has so graciously given us to continue our walk of faith faithfully and loyally to God. We need to ask God for a double portion of his Holy Spirit. And we need to ask him to make us Elisha's, to be people who change the atmosphere wherever we go in our families, in our churches, in our communities. Women, to make us women who will do God's work in God's way so God's blessing and protection will follow. And my prayer is through his example that it would begin with each one of us today. So I want to close in prayer and ask God for the double portion of the Spirit to fall on each one of us here today. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you not only for your word, but you promised through your son Jesus that you would never leave one of us as orphans, but that you would send forth your spirit to reside within us and to come upon us. And I pray, Father God, that from this story that we learn, that we cry out to you for a double portion of your Holy Spirit to fall on each woman in this room today. I pray, God, that you would stir up the gifts that you have placed within each woman. I pray that you would pour out and anoint new gifts. I pray that the hearts of these women here would hunger for more of you. Those who are hungering for the gift of prophecy, Lord God, pour out and impart your Holy Spirit upon them. Those who are hungering for the gift of prayer, the gift of mercy, the gift of healing, Holy Spirit, come in your power. Impart your gifts Fan into flame that which you have already begun in each woman here. Lord God, anybody that's hungering for the gift of evangelism, I pray for more. Or the gift of teaching, Lord, raise up teachers in our midst. For the gift of wisdom, discernment, Lord, I pray, pour out a portion of your spirit 
that you would be more, that we could rise up and be Elishas in our day to a world who is becoming desperately evil before our very eyes. Lord, send us out in that compassion and mercy and love to lift the name of Jesus high, to heal people in your name, to bring glory and power to people, to discern the truth from the wrong. Lord, help us be change agents, to change the atmosphere wherever we go. Our cry today, Lord, is make each one of us an Elisha. And may it be in Jesus' name.